Well, Howard, it, it's almost lunchtime, you know. Uh, <laughs> By your standards. Here. So, one, I want to thank you for coming. And um, I want to talk for a moment about something um, that plays very an, an important element in cycles, and you've spent a lot of time writing about it. And before I get there, one of the great challenges for all of us to contemplate today is this area of trying to understand finance and financial markets. And many of you work in that area, and I want to challenge each of you today, because this is an area Howard and I, and we might touch on it, have focused on together for uh, more than four decades. And that challenge is, what do people think? What is their view? There's a quote in this book that Howard gives you from John Kenneth Galbraith talking about how little finance or access to capital or financial markets as you know it, how little it plays as people talk about history and what occurred in history. Now, over the years, and there it comes. Why don't you tell us about that to start, Howard? Well. Um, first of all, it's from a book called The Brief History of Financial Euphoria, which I read a very long time ago, which I recommend to everyone. It gives you a good feeling for cyclicality, for the behavior of the herd, for the importance of contrarianism. And, uh, and, and, and it is an honest book in the sense that it is brief, and I enjoy uh, that. Uh, but the, the point is that in investing in particular, one of the outstanding characteristics is shortness of memory. And the point is we, we know so much from history, but if we disregard history, we know so little. If we disregard history, then every time something happens anew, we have to start from scratch figuring out what it means. If we understand history, we can put it in a we can do what I call in the book pattern recognition. And we can say, oh yeah, that, that's like, that. I saw that 10 years ago and 30 years ago, and, uh, and, uh, that's, and, and it, here's what it comes from, and here's what plays out, and here's what it's going to result in. But most people ignore history. Most booms, and I, you know, I've, I've probably lived through about a half a dozen real booms, uh, in my 50 years in the business, um, are usually about something new. And the internet in 99, the nifty 50, Xerox in 69, whatever it might be, subprime mortgage securities. And the people who get excited about it, who, who, who cotton to it, who uh, are uh, intoxicated by the positives and willing to ignore the negatives, um, if you, if you say to them, you know, well, that, kinda, that happened 20 and 40 years ago and, and it, it ended badly, what they say is they use the four worst words in the world. It's different this time. Uh, the rules of the past don't apply. The, you know, it, it, yes, the average PE ratio historically has been 16, but now it's 32 and that's okay because the internet has changed the world and something like that. And so, um, uh, go back one slide though, if you will. And, and what it says is that past experience, to the extent that it is part of memory at all, is dismissed as the primitive refuge of those who do not have the insight to appreciate the wonders of the present. And, you know, they, they, if you say to somebody in 99 who's buying an internet stock which has no profits and no sales and, you know, at an astronomical price, they say, well, you just don't get it. You're an old fogey. And the point is that the past is relevant and, uh, and now you can bring up that next slide, Michael, because that was a good one. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And, and uh, most of the time, it's not different. Now, clearly, some of the time, it is different, but not as often as people think. Let's and, talk for a moment about uh, this slide by Reinhardt. And uh, there was a book written this time. It's different. And it really related to sovereign debt and credit. And so I'm at Berkeley in 65 studying credit, and almost all sovereign debt is rated AAA. 
and it's considered the least risky debt of all. And the head of the Federal Reserve, uh, Paul Volcker, in the 70s, is telling everyone that no country ever defaulted, ever went bankrupt. Yet it has absolutely nothing to do with history. And I think I want to just underline this point uh, that Howard has made here. When you step back in history, ask yourself, ha have you done the original research? What is common wisdom? You know, as I listened to Paul uh, Volcker in that period of time, uh, Chairman Volcker, talk, and uh, the speech I remember most, uh, Howard, was one in the, around 80 or 81, that Poland is not international harvester. Both Poland and international harvester were trading at 31 cents on the dollar. And his point was, Poland is a country, countries don't default. Or don't go bankrupt. And of course, International Harvester could go bankrupt. Well, he was right, but he was wrong. International Harvester paid you off 100 cents on the dollar, never missed an interest payment, and Poland reorganized its debt in the 30s. So for every dollar of debt, you got 30 cents of something. Well, he was right semantically, he was just not right financially. Right? Yeah. And so I just want to stress um, the importance of research. And Howard, let's go back to the late 1960s, early 1970s. And when I went to Wall Street, we had fixed commissions for stock. And the highest compensated people uh, in the financial system were those that were generally uh, equity salesmen. Because when you bought a stock, the charge was 1%. If you bought a million dollars worth of stock, you had to pay 10,000. Today, that might be $3.75 yeah. if you can't negotiate a better deal. And so they lived during this period of time, but when you went there, uh, here's a look if you wanted to just buy five shares of Berkshire Hathaway. And Warren Buffett, uh, who's a good friend of Howard and a good friend of mine, if you wanted to buy a stock, you can see what you would have paid then and what you've put it paid now. So being in that business, it's been a tough business to be in once you uh, went into an open market. But the issue is, if you step back in that point in time, the fundamental issue was sales. And if you look at the pyramid on Wall Street, as Howard and I uh, entered this period of time, almost 50 years, the power was in sales. Then it went to trading. And if you were long and overnight, you did a little research and try to figure out what is this thing. And so what my focus was, and Howard being one of the most representative individuals of this dramatic change that occurred, was changing this pyramid. Let's start with research. Mm -hmm. The fundamental part of investing is research. Have you done the data? So if you've come here today, have you checked off anything in the book? Uh, what these little post-its that you might want to relate to. And then we can go to trading. Can you actually buy it? It might be an interesting idea, but can you invest? And in the case of Howard, buying a million dollars or something is not going to affect your portfolios or your clients. So the question in trading, is there a big enough market for you to deploy capital? And lastly, now you're focused on buying and selling process, but the inverting Howard, take us back in your own career for a while and talk about why you chose to go to Wall Street, how you ended up at Citibank when we met each other. Well, um, you know, I started off, my dad was an accountant, and I thought I'd become an accountant. I took, actually took high, accounting in high school and liked it, and uh, I didn't admit that while well, no, I was in high school. But, so I, I went to Wharton, and I figured I'd take a degree in accounting. But then when I got there, I started to study finance, and I found it more interesting, so I shifted over. Then I went to University of Chicago for a master's degree, and that was in accounting. And when I got out of there, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And applied for six different jobs in six different aspects of finance. But I had had a, a good summer at Citibank the year before. I liked the people. I liked what I did, so I went into investment research, and it was nothing more, wasn't a much more conscious decision than that. Um, and that was, <clears throat> that was 1969. Started off 
in equity research um, and then um, became director of research. And the bank engaged in what was called nifty 50 investing. Um, it, it invested in the best and fastest growing companies in America without regard to price, because the, the official dictum was if it's good enough and fast growing enough, it's worth any price, which is kind of the opposite of what I think you believe, Michael. And if you bought the Nifty 50 the day I got there in 68, and if you hold it diligently uh, until 73, uh, you lost almost all your money in the best companies in America. And there's a lesson in that, of course, that, uh, that it's not what you buy, it's what you pay for. But then in 78, because that exercise with which I, I was associated was so unsuccessful, uh, it was time for me to find a new job. I was lucky I didn't get canned. Um, and uh, I switched to the bond department in order to manage money. And then in August of uh, 78, I got a call from the head of the bond department. And he said, there's some guy named Milken or something out in California, and he deals in these things called high yield bonds. And can you figure out what that means? Now, you know, we, we take it for granted today. We all know what they mean. And actually, high yield bonds are quite mainstream today. But in those days, they were an obscure corner that very few people knew about. They were called junk bonds. And uh, so I set about trying to study them. I met with Mike in November of 78. Uh, and then came out here to California in, uh, to visit with him in January 79 for the first time. And uh, now I'm investing in the worst companies in America. And there's a really important lesson in that, that in good investing is not a matter of buying good things, but buying things well. Howard, I want to may maybe paraphrase what you've said. I'm not sure you're investing in the worst companies in America. What you're investing in... Well, I use that as a figure of speech. ...many great companies that have the wrong capital structure. Right. right. Okay, and so once again, as we focus on this, I, I want to take us back to the beginning and what's focused for you, your children, your grandchildren. In a recent poll in the United States of people under 30, they asked the people under 30, will you have a better life than your parents had? And so maybe we could just you know, pull up that slide here for a moment and have you reflect on what percent of people under 30 in America thought that they would have a better life than their parents? At, at what date? Uh, in the last few months. Uh -huh. Okay. So you picked your, we're not going to embarrass you here, but if we look at the answer, you'll see it's a very low percentage. And if you go to Western Europe, you'll see a very low percentage. There is no country over 30%. But as you travel the world, if you're in China, it's 78%. And in your Brazil, in spite of everything that's occurred, and Turkey is more than 50%. Uh, higher than the United States, as is India and other countries. And if you go to Mexico today, that, that number is probably in the 80s. And so the question is, why do people feel that way? How do they feel? 90% are optimistic of the future in Mexico. And so they have a much different view of the world. And so one of the challenges for finance, and we're going to talk about it today, as we talk about these cycles, is that why do 50% of people under 30 think socialism might be a good idea? They obviously haven't been studying what's occurred in Venezuela as you've destroyed an entire country, the country with the most reserves. And you say to yourself, well, why do people feel this way? Well, the average person in America, what is its interaction with the financial system? One, a student loan, and the burden of the student loan that's now approaching one and a half trillion, that is confining them as they think about their life, and second, a mortgage, whether they or their parents, and during this period of time, which we will talk about, they almost lost their home or they lost their home. So what is the financial system doing for them uh, and this connection? But let's go back to accounting, Howard. Uh, in many ways, accounting is a language. 
understanding a balance sheet, reading those footnotes, et cetera. But you outlined in the book a few things that you felt were fundamentally required to be an investor, understand cycles. Accounting was one, but why don't we talk about a few of those? Well, I think, I think uh, everybody knows you have to understand accounting, you have to know finance, you should know something about history, but the most important thing, which they don't teach you in business school, is psychology. And uh, if, you, if you go back and look at the past, um, if you look at a, a graph of the economy for the last 50 years, it kind of looks like this. It's got an upward trend and very modest uh, divergence from the trend. Sometimes the, you know, the trend is a 2% two, trend line. Sometimes it's up three and sometimes one. In extremes, it's up four or down one or two. Very modest volatility. If you look at company results, companies have leverage, financial and, and operating, and their profits go like this. If the, if, a, if the economy's up 2%, profits go up 10. If the economy's up 20%, profits go up 30, and, and, and so forth. And so the, the um, and, and, if the, and if the economy's down two, then for a typical company, maybe profits will be down 15. So the, the graph of profits is much more volatile than the graph of uh, the economy. And then if you look at a graph of the stock market, it looks like this. Why? What's the difference? And the difference is psychology. And you know, uh, Richard Feynman, the Great physicists said that uh, physics would be much harder if electrons had feelings. Uh, we walk in the room, we turn on the light switch, the lights go on every time. We don't even wonder about it. I, well, I wonder if they're going to go on this time. But the, 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 that's because the electrons go in this pattern. They never go there. They never say, no, we're on strike. They never forget to move. They always do what they're supposed to do. But, but people have feelings. And people rarely do what they're supposed to do and they uh, often react in the extreme to the events that, that develop, and uh, those extreme reactions cause this extreme volatility. They overreact to things, and sometimes they don't react at all, and sometimes they don't react as they should. So I think that um, if, if you want to uh, exist in the investment world, and uh, you want to, you can just buy and hold good things if, if, you, if you want to take that approach. But if you want to improve upon that, I think it's very important to understand the ebb and flow of psychology and, and act accordingly. So let's look at that a different way. Um, I arrived around 1 o'clock last night from Ashland, Oregon, where they have a Shakespeare festival uh, and have for decades. And um, you wonder why are people going to Shakespeare plays hundreds and hundreds of years later? Why is it relevant? And if you step back and start thinking about what are these plays about, it underlines what Howard has addressed. So let's take a look at you know, some of these plays. What is Hamlin about? What is Macbeth about? What are these about? Well. We see it in West Side Story, but if we took a look at the plays and talked about what is the emotion or what is someone addressing in that play, Macbeth, self-deception, ambition, indecision, friendship, love, hate, prejudice, betrayal, honor, duty, all of these human emotions which exist today. And one of the things Howard writes about is what are some of the traits required to be an investor uh, to take care, to take advantage of, of cycles? And one of them is aggressiveness. And so we could go to Hamlin and talk about inaction, inner struggle, et cetera, that he wrote about. And Howard, I think one of the things that strikes me, and I think anyone that's read your work over the decades, has been that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Mm -hmm. And you point that out. You love to write, and I think people love to read you because you express things that are often extremely sophisticated and complex in ways that are easy. Thank you. Uh, 
and congratulations on a great book again. A lot of people always wish they would write a book. How did you get yourself to say, okay, I'm gonna stop and write a book? Mm, good question. Uh, well, it all started with, with my memos to clients, which I started writing in 1990. Um, I can't exactly remember why I started, it's a long time ago. I know I never said, you know, if I, <laughs> if I, if I write them, it'll, do, it'll, it'll get us more business, or if I write them, you know, the pe people will subscribe. I think I just had something that I wanted to say, and I said it. And the point is that I, one of the main reasons that I write is that I enjoy it. I'd rather write than not. And they, you know, the Bill, Bill Graham of the, of the Fillmore, uh, which was a rock club in the 70s, said it's only work if you'd rather be doing something else. And I wouldn't. And if you look at the memos, uh, on, you can go to online to oaktreecapital.com and look at the memos and you see that there's almost always one coming out in September and one coming out in January, which means I wrote it on summer vacation and Christmas vacation. And, and uh, anyway, so I started writing these memos and with one in 90 and one in 91 and maybe I didn't write one in 92. And, in, and for 10 years, nobody responded. I never had a response. Not only did nobody ever say it was good, nobody ever said I got it. And, and uh, of course, these, this was in the days of mail, and so we would print them up and fold them and put them in an envelope and address them and send them out. And nobody ever responded. But then on the beginning of, of uh, 2000, I, uh, the first day, I put out a memo called bubble.com about the tech stocks, and it turned out to, it had two virtues. Number one, it was correct, and number one, it was correct soon, which are both important. And then, then uh, after 10 years, as I say, I became an overnight success. Uh, but then... Well, it wasn't 10 years, uh, Howard. It was 30 years. Yeah, maybe. Okay, okay. And, and I think this is something I just want to stress. When we talk about a frame of reference or understanding history, uh, if you watch the 100-meter dash in the Olympics that a person covers in less than 10 seconds, you can wonder, well, it's a gold medal, et cetera. Well, how long did you prepare? That person might have prepared their entire life for those 10 seconds. And so being prepared and understanding, it wasn't the 10 years. And in fact, probably the previous 20 even had more effect on you uh, from that standpoint. Right. And I just want to relate to something that was really important Howard talked about. Many of you who might choose to be in the investment business today, it was really this failure of the Nifty 50 that created modern money management. People gave their money to a trust department. That large bank could manage your money. And as Howard said, they put you into this Nifty 50 stocks you could just hold forever. And the fact that you lost half your money adjusted for inflation half your money. Well, if you lost half your money, plain it's safe. What did you have to lose to go to the growth of the mutual fund industry or other small money managers that gave birth because of the failure uh, of the traditional safe system from that standpoint? And, and so I just want to stress on this. There, there are very few accidents, and Howard talks about luck, and we'll get into it shortly. But there's a very famous quote, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And what is luck? Luck is when opportunity meets the prepared mind. So I just want to come back to, you were not an overnight success. <laughs> that you prepared 30 years yeah. for that. Well, anyway, so the, so the memos continued. And then, uh, then uh, we connected with uh, Warren Buffett on a transaction coming out of the Enron. Uh, and, and we were, you know, we, one of our main activities is distressed debt investing, and he had a position in one of the subsidiaries, and we were, we were a little bigger than him. And so he gave us his proxy, and he said, you work it out. And so that's how we really uh, got, got close in the early 2000s. And then I wrote a memo, I think, in which I made some reference to him. And, uh, and uh, I, I sent it to him. I said, I just want to make sure you saw it. And he says, yeah, I saw it. He says, it was really good. And he says, in fact, if you'll write a book, I'll give you a blurb for the jacket. I had always thought that when I retired, I would turn the memos into a book. But when you have that from Buffett, then you have to get into gear. And so that's really the immediate reason why I wrote it. 
and I started in 2010 and came out in 2011. It was called The Most Important Thing. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and, and I, always, I owe it all to Warren Buffett. And on the front, it says, this is that rarity, a useful book, Warren Buffett. And uh, that, those few words sold a lot of copies. So Howard, let's step back and talk for a moment about the most important thing. In that book, you listed a number of important things. Yeah. But Market Cycles is the only book you've written from that list. Yes. Why Market Cycles? Well, I, th I think that, uh, so uh, the book says the most important thing, each, there are 21 chapters and each one says, starts off by saying the most important thing is, and then it's a different thing. Because in investing, there is no one important thing. There is maybe, you might argue, there's no, uh, you know, what was it, uh, Lombardi's as, uh, it, it, winning is not the, well, let's see how many people in the audience even know who Lombardi. Vince Lombardi is. Vince Lombardi, who, anybody? Okay, well, we have at least a third. He said, winning is not everything, it's the only thing. And as I say in the book, I'm not exactly sure what that means. But I think that the two most important topics in investing are risk and cycles. And they're connected because where you are in the cycle determines your risk for the, for the intermediate term. Now. Uh, the reason I think risk is so important is because uh, I think that the distinguishing mark between a great investor and a not great investor is not merely how good the return was, but how much risk they took to get it. If you, you know, you can take, you can lever up an S&P, now, nowadays with derivatives or ETFs, you can buy an, e an ETF that goes up or down four times as much as the S&P, or maybe eight times. And if you, if you buy that and you go into a very positive period in the market, you'll have an astronomical return, but it doesn't mean you're a great investor. Because it, they'll say, look at that guy. He went up eight times as much as the S&P. Well, guess what? If it had been a down period, he would have gone down eight times as much as the S&P. He added no value, he's not a good investor. I think that an exceptional investor is someone who has a good return disproportionate to the risk borne a good return with the risk under control. So I think that, I actually do think that risk is the most important thing. And in the book, there are 21 chapters, and there are three on risk. Understanding risk, recognizing risk, and controlling risk. But I also think that where we are in the cycle is enormously influential in terms of how much risk you'll bear. And uh, I'm not crazy about the title of this book, I was encouraged to do that by my publisher because they thought if we said mastering the market cycle, we'll sell more books because everybody will figure out that they'll get rich. But I like the subtitle. And the subtitle is Getting the Odds on Your Side. We don't know what the future holds. I am not a believer in forecasts. In fact, Michael started off by, by, with a quote from Galbraith. Uh, my other favorite quote from Galbraith is that there are two kinds of forecasters, the ones who don't know, and the ones who don't know they don't know. And, and I believe that very strongly, and I am firmly in the first camp. I don't know what the future is gonna bring. And I don't think anybody does. The future can only be thought of intelligently as a probability distribution. What is the range of things that may happen? Which is the most likely? Which other ones are probable? and which ones are unlikely. And we describe a great quote from Elroy Dimson at the London Business School. More, risk means more things can happen than will happen. That's the source of risk, is that the future is uncertain. And, and, and if the future could be predicted, in theory, there would be no risk. So let's step back, Howard, and try. So we're really talking about risk-adjusted returns. Right. And what Howard has said is, can you achieve returns with little to no risk? Uh, and that's quite different from someone that's taking a lot of risk. And so as we think about the world we live in, there's been enormous movement today from um, active management of assets to ETFs or passive management of assets. But it's easy to understand what's occurred. What's occurred here is the market has gone up so significantly. And so if you're fully invested, i.e. in an ETF, 
by nature, you're 100% invested in whatever that asset category is versus a money manager who might be 50% invested, 60%. So in an up market, it's very difficult to outperform a person that's fully invested. However, in a down market, which we really haven't seen in this growth of passive investment or ETFs, uh, what is going to occur? Okay, obviously you're going to go down more because you're fully invested, not necessarily hedged, and you also run the risk of the issue of redemption. Mm -hmm. So we really haven't. So Howard and I are firm believers in fundamental analysis. Would you like to touch base at all on passive and, or sure. investment versus fundamental investment? And obviously your background at Wharton and Chicago, we both lived during a period in academic life of this idea that the markets were perfect, yeah. that uh, no one could outperform the market, our academic uh, training, people won Nobel Prizes for it. They even won Nobel Prizes for telling you capital structure didn't matter, uh, et cetera. So take us back to this debate, uh, Howard. Well, I was a Wharton undergraduate, and I learned the practical side of investing. And then I went off to the University of Chicago for my master's, and I learned the theoretical side. And the, the finance theory, the key theories, had just been developed almost entirely at Chicago in 63-4, that period, uh, was when they came, emerged. And uh, we learned things, like Michael described, uh, one of the most important of which is called the efficient market hypothesis. And what it says is that people, the market consists of a whole bunch of people who are highly motivated to get rich, they're all intelligent, they're all numerate, they're all hooked up by computer, they're all trying very hard, and their search for bargains has the effect of driving bargains out of existence. That if, they, if there are any cheap stocks, they find them, they buy them, their buying raises the price of the stock to full value. If there are any overpricings, they sell them, they, that brings the price down to the point where that's fair too. So all prices are fair give, for the risk involved, QED, you cannot outperform the market. That's the official conclusion of the uh, uh, efficient market hypothesis. And by the way, they told us in Chicago, uh, empirically, that the average mutual fund had not beaten the market, but charged high fees. Clearly, everybody collectively can't beat the market. So on average, they had, on average, all investors do average, but after high fees, all average on average do below average. And you shouldn't be in a mutual fund which is actively managed and has high fees. You should, and they said back when I was a kid, why not just buy one I mean, of every stock are, in the S&P? Are you suggesting we're both still not kids? We're both still not kids and we're still both not kids. <laughs> but, but they said, why not just buy every stock in the S&P? No, we didn't have a term for it, but about five, six years later, the term index fund emerged, and there started to be index funds. And the, if, if the average active investor does worse than the market, then it's better to be in an index fund which merely emulates the market. Index, index investing got off to a very slow start in the mid-'70s. Vanguard started the first serious index fund, Jack Bogle. And it still grew very slowly because you had to overcome the traditional resistance to turning things over to automatic processes. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, I wrote a memo. If you want to read on this subject, I wrote a memo in June entitled uh, Investing Without People. And I talk about the uh, historic development of uh, index funds. And uh, it quotes Ned Johnson of, uh, of Fidelity. And he said, no American is going to settle for being below average. Now that is really, a, 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 I have nothing against Ned, but it's a great example of, uh, I think that that uh, statement has no introspection, or alternatively, maybe it's the statement of a salesman. Because, of course, you would settle for average if everything else you could do would put you, make you below average. And, and, and for so many people, so many people would have been better off if they had average. Uh, anyway, uh, the point is that, that the highly priced active management 
uh, in broad swaths, clearly not everyone, did so much worse than low-cost passive investing that in the last 10 or 15 years, the movement to index investing and other passive forms, Mike mentioned ETFs, has gained a lot of traction. And now 37 or 40 percent of all equity mutual fund capital is run passively. But, but the, important I, I, thing, the important thing I want to state before you jump in is that it's, it's not that, act, that passive management is so good. I believe this occurred because active management was so bad. Well, also, I think it occurred as you focus on cycles during a period where markets went up. That's true. Interest rates went down. So it's a period of time where you wanted to be fully invested. And so we, we'll see how it does during a period of time when markets go down, uh, where you're fully invested from that standpoint. Uh, so Howard, I want to kind of go back in time to your career change, mm -hmm. uh, going from stocks to bonds. And yeah. so if I pulled up the six lessons of credit here for a moment and just take a look at them and try to relate them uh, a little bit to investing and cycles. So credit is what counts, not leverage. And we could look at, as we go through some of these cycles, what occurred uh, at the end of 07, 08, where you had financial institutions leverage 60, 70, 80 to one that were rated AAA. Mm -hmm. uh, we could look at loans to real estate. And I would, as we look at some of these cycles, uh, real estate played a large uh, part in the latter part of the 80s in the problems of his belief that it only goes up. Interest rates, you know, Howard doesn't have a whole chapter on this, but who can predict interest rates? And very few people have ever successfully. And as you look at home prices, uh, a Nobel Prize was issued for pointing out in 120 years, the price of a home went down 50%, or went up 50%. And this idea that you can leverage an asset 95 or 98% to one with that volatility. And Howard writes about that, and we'll come back in the book. As we look at the others on that list here, Howard, I want to go kind of back to the end of that list of these six lessons of credit. And one of them was on sovereign debt, but anyone could have known that uh, if you went back and took a look at that. Uh, we could see that the very last one is debt underpins all markets. And so understanding debt, and so in recent days here in 2008, uh, in October 12th today, we've had a lot of volatility, and one of the reasons cited for that volatility was the increase in interest rates. But let's get back to your point on risk, Howard. Can we generate rates of return with less risk? So if any of you uh, play bridge or other types of games, uh, your knowledge of bidding and how people play allows you to improve your probability of success in the play of a hand. And I remember, Howard, one of the things I mentioned to you back in 78 was when you invest in equities, and you wrote about it later, it's a popularity contest. If no one in the world agrees with you, unless you're willing to buy the whole company, you will not be successful. And the exciting thing about investing in debt is if no one else in the world agrees with you, but you are right, you will generate significant rates of return. Talk about this movement as you think about risk relative in equity and debt markets. Well, you know, uh Trends in the investment business go in, 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 in long periods. And from roughly the 60s, at least, until uh, 2000, um, stock, stock investing, equities, became more and more popular, and bonds got less and less respect. Um, I remember when I was in the investment research department at Citibank, and they had these all the young people followed Xerox and Coke and, and, and Polaroid, and, and they had these two old guys 
from Germany who sat in a corner and they would put out a statistical sheet on bonds every two weeks. Uh, it was hard when you didn't have computers. But I remember, and I still have, when they put one out and up in the upper right-hand corner in a box, it says, our last issue. Because everybody lost interest in bonds. Stocks were the great thing. Growth was the story. And, and you know, everybody, the, the pendulum swung toward fascination with growth. Everybody bought more stocks. You know, and I imagined back in the, in the late 90s, uh, the CIO of a pension fund saying, it, well, you know, we have a few bonds left. My predecessor bought those. I, nobody can remember why, but we're going to get rid of those. And so by the time 2000 rolled around and the puncturing of the tech bubble, everybody was in stocks. Nobody was in bonds. Stocks went down for three years in a row for the first time since 1929. Bonds did great, but nobody had them. So then everybody wakes up and they say, to hell with that growth stuff. We want income and safety. And now the pendulum swings towards bonds. And the truth about bonds, which all the people forgot in the, in the equity mania, is as Michael says, your return in stock investing comes, certainly in the short run, from swings in popularity. You find a stock you think is worth 20, you buy it for 10. As he says, if nobody comes to agree with you, it sits at 10 for the rest of your life, and you don't make any money. The great thing about bonds, which very few people understood, is that in, with bonds or debt, your income does not, your, your return doesn't come from the market. It comes from the issuing company. It is a contract with the issuer. You give me money now, I'm going to give you X interest a year for the next X years, and at the end of X years, I'm going to give you your money back. It's a contract. And if they stay in business, they have to honor that contract. If they fail to honor the contract, you get the company. There's a slight exaggeration. But, but the point is that the returns on bonds are contractual and dependable. And, um, and that's very different. And the expected return on stocks is higher than on bonds because they're riskier, as it should be. But the uncertainty with regard to stocks is enormous, whereas the uncertainty involved in a contractual relationship with a creditworthy company is not enormous. And, and this is what people overlook. Now, of course, I believe that, that uh, you know, bonds have picked up in attractiveness and popularity, and especially uh, loans, which are senior in their companies and floating rate, so you don't have interest rate risk. And like any other investment, there, there's the risk of becoming overpopular. So let's take a look, just for a moment, at this period of time that Howard talks about as his transition from equity to debt investing, trying to reduce the risk and generating rates of return in a period of time that I often refer to as the most important period in modern financial yeah. history, this period of the early 70s to the mid 70s. And the particular year I would focus on is 1974. This is a year when the stock market went down 50%. Interest rates doubled, and this was kind of the end of the financial structure as we knew it based on a banking system. And one of the keys that potentially de risked things is once your economy is no longer financed by a banking system, but by tens of thousands of institutional investors, you change. Energy prices at this time doubled, and the stock market went down substantially. And if you remember, Howard, it was one at the end of 79, but the one I remember particularly was the one at the end of 74 that no one would ever buy a stock again, okay? which. Howard would tell you signals it's time to invest in the market. The minute that was on the cover of Business Week. What was this result in 74? Companies with the highest rates of return, those growth companies, were denied capital as the financial institutions had to focus on saving themselves. Yeah, this therefore stopped job creation. Jobs were lost. 
And as the financial institutions were weakened in so many ways, if we go to the next slide, uh, these things occurred. And lastly, it created the modern financial markets, and you now finance companies in the public and private markets. Because if you were the head of a business, do you want your business dependent on the, on the strength of the financial institution that's lending you money? So if they're in trouble, you're in trouble. And the Asian crisis in the 1990s started in Thailand where an entire economy was financed by five banks and when they were in trouble. But as this, this world that Howard has lived in during this period of time, essentially the public and private markets have replaced the banks as the funder and banks shrunk by 50% adjusted for inflation in the 1980s, but the country grew from that standpoint. So Howard, I'd like to, to take a look at a lesson here that both you and I spoke about. If we go back to say 73, before the bond market really broke down and interest rates to 76 and 2008 to 2011, if we could take a look at how common those periods of time are in a slide. So take us back to 2008, 2011. And this, this slide that uh, Howard's firm Oak Tree really took advantage of in this period of time. To me, I was on television telling everyone, we've already been through this, this is just a repeat. The challenge in life is how many people in financial markets mm. in 2008 even remember the early to mid 1970s, as Howard pointed out. Well, it's, it's interesting. Obviously, um, if to have been in the investment business in 08 and to have the experience of 74, you had to be working by definition 34 years. But the truth of the matter is that the investment business was terrible in the decade of the 70s. You couldn't get a job in the 70s. I know people, classmates of mine from grad school, who wanted to go into the investment business, but rather than get out in 69, when I did, they got out in 70, they couldn't get a job in the investment business for their whole lives. And they dug in in other fields. But the point is, you had to have your job in the 60s. And that means by 08, you had to be working more than 40 years. How many people work more than 40 years? So by definition, the pool of people with the, with the recognition of the past pattern is, is very small. And you know, um, clearly we ran into uh, very difficult problems. The overinvestment on high leverage in the subprime products in 05, 06, um, caused the, you know, the loss of some of the most important banks and, and uh, investment banks. And people started talking about the end of the world. And uh, security prices melted down, loan prices melted down, and activity froze because everybody was uncertain. Will there be a tomorrow? If I buy anything today, will, it, will there be a market tomorrow? Will it have any value tomorrow? And all liquidity dried up. And as I say, people were talking about the end of the world. And it was the most pronounced cycle that, that, uh, that we've lived through. Uh, but still, there was really no reason. I mean, I, I, I kept thinking about what Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. People were just afraid. They weren't afraid of anything rational. They were just afraid. And what you had to do is you had to keep your wits. And you know, one of the hopes is that, that if you read history, if you, if you read the book, if you understand cycles, you will be able to reduce the emotional influences at that time and cut through them. And, and maybe we'll just say, keep your wits about you. So we concluded in late 08, after the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers put the markets into free fall, that uh, you know, uh, will, the, will the financial world end or not? And what we said was that it's hard to predict the end of the financial world. If you conclude that the financial world will end, it's hard to have any idea what to do. And most of the time, the financial world doesn't end. 
we also made a very simple calculation. Should we buy or not? Well, if we invest and the financial world ends, it kind of doesn't matter. But if we don't invest and the financial world doesn't end, then we didn't do our job. So by that, you know, here we are in an environment where really people had no idea what was coming next and, and we're talking about the end of the world. And I thought the analysis was rather simple, that we had to buy. So at Oak Tree, we invested $650 million a week in the last 15 weeks of, uh, of uh, 08. That's about $10 billion. And that's really all you had to do. It almost didn't matter what you did as long as you bought. And it was a point in time in the cycle. And these points in time come along every once in a while where you don't need conservatism, caution, risk control, discipline, patience, or selectivity. You need money and the nerve to spend it. And if you had money and nerve to spend it in, in late 08 in the credit market or early 09 in the stock market, you've made a ton of money um, and, uh, by playing that cycle. So I think as a frame of reference, uh, it was 1974 and I was on this institutional investor panel with one of the leading uh, professors in the world of finance. And he pointed out that his Z scores, if you remember those, Howard, were predicting that 700 out of the 2,000 or so largest companies in America were going to go bankrupt. I had pointed out, if you study the Depression in history, uh, that was not going to happen. And then uh, you made 100% on your money in 75 or 6, mm -hmm. unleveraged, just buying debt, similar to the opportunities that Howard had identified in 08, 09. And I was on a panel with him in 77. And it was so interesting because he pointed out that his Z-scores had predicted the four major bankruptcies that had occurred in the previous four years. But had you not been at the previous session, you would have not realized that he had predicted 700 to include four. <laughs> and I think that is the issue. And Howard, one of the other areas I think that might be interesting for you to touch on is that it's interesting when you think about what occurred in this 08 session, we all should have fully understood it because we had a dry run in 1985, 86, 87, 88. When the price of housing went down, when the price of oil went down, and almost every single major financial institution in Texas did not survive, all those triple A's. And most of them in Louisiana, Arkansas, and Colorado had problems because the price of homes went down as much as 50%. And so fully understanding what can happen when the price of residential real estate, the United States more than any country should have fully understood this going into the last 08. But the point I want to address, Howard, really is when we think of the ratings, and S&P and rated more than 14, 15,000 securities, AAA, there are only three or so companies in the United States that are AAA by both. Uh, yet when you look at a rating that rates something triple C or single B, uh, you find that if the it might be a triple C at 100, but it might be a triple A at 40. But the rating remains the same. And how do you take that into consideration, Howard? Well, you know, if, if, you, if you take anything away from today, I think that's the most important point. Um, as I said before, it's not what you buy, it's what you pay. And the great revolution, I think, of the period we're discussing here, when the Nifty 50 were the great companies and they, and the, they failed as investments, and when the, shall we say, low-rated companies in the high-yield bond world succeeded a, an investment, the, the great transition is from the belief that good is good and bad is bad to the belief that anything can be good at a price. And it's an enormous sea change, and it has dominated the last, really, 40 years. And, and I, and I want to say that, that Michael was really at the vanguard of that change. Um, and, and it should not be underestimated. When I went into the high-yield bond business, 1978, 
you know, I wanted to figure out what we're talking about here. And in those days, of course, we didn't have anything computerized. So if you wanted to study bonds, you had to go to something called Moody's Manual. Moody's Manual was a book literally this thick with the thinnest paper in the world, <laughs> onion skin. It had, it had billions of pages in it, and it had all the data on all the companies that had bonds outstanding. So you pull it down from the shelf, and you find this one's rated triple A, single A, single B, triple C. And I said, well, what does that mean? So I went to the front where they defined the ratings. And here's what it said about a single B bond, which is most of what you uh, originated, most of what I bought, single A. Fails to possess the characteristics of a desirable investment. Now, if, if I took Jim Williams out to the street, and if he, if he needed a car, and I had a car out there I wanted to sell, and I showed it to him, and I said, Jim, would you buy my car? Uh, Jim Williams is with us today. He runs the Getty right. Trust, Chief right. Investment Officer. Does a great job. So that's why we're yeah, focused on here him. on October 12, 2018, yeah. on Jim Williams. Right. <laughs> if I said to him, would you buy my car? Hopefully, there's a question he would ask before he says yes or no. What is it? What's the price? Moody's was saying that B-rated bonds are bad investments regardless of price. And really, the big realization of the last 10, 40 years is that just about any asset can get cheap enough so that it's a good investment. And most investments can get so expensive that they're a bad investment. And the revolution of the high yield bond industry was really to say, you see, in the, if, you, if, if, if we had prevailing views from Moody's that a B-rated bond is a bad investment, then by definition, a B-rated bond could not be issued. And in those days, a bond rated below investment grade, which means below triple B, could not be issued. It wasn't proper. The only way you got to have bonds rated below triple B is if they were issued as investment grade and then went bad. We call those fallen angels. The revolution that was effectuated in the high yield bond industry, primarily by Mike, some others, and that has dominated the last 40 years appropriately, is that if a risky company, he doesn't like me to say that, if a highly levered company <laughs> issues bonds, which have some risk due to the high leverage, it's OK to buy them if they offer enough interest to compensate. Now, that seems like such an obvious statement, that for every bond of every riskiness, there is an interest rate which is compensatory and an interest rate which is excessive. And yet this, is, this was a thinking that was absent prior to 78 when everybody thought that the, the route to success as an investor was to buy high quality assets. And by the way, buy them at any price. And now we look back at that and think how stupid that was. So uh, to take you back in time, <coughs> the firm I joined in the <clears throat> late 1960s was the leading research firm in the world. Paul Miller, who, Ma who Howard knows, head of the investment committee at Penn long before then Howard took over, Jay Sherrod, Clay Anderson, et cetera. And they were the leading equity firm. And I <clears throat> said to them, what about debt? And as Howard was saying, in the 60s, debt was really investment grade, or it was private. And the insurance companies rated not investment grade, investment grade, because it was internal, the way they looked at it. So I went and took a look at the recommended list of stocks. And 80% of them would have been non-investment grade. And so the understanding of this capital structure, I would finish the story by telling you that the firm had the leading aerospace and airline analyst rated number one in the country. And he was recommending TWA. And I said to him, you know, Herb, 
Uh, it's interesting you're recommending TWA. You know, we're buying TWA four converts at 25 cents on the dollar. Uh, and he told me he didn't know they had convertibles outstanding. <laughs> so the focus on the capital structure was not something you really focused on, you know, from that standpoint. And, and I want to go, if I could, just for a moment to capital structure, Howard. And I think one of the things you've signaled in your firm is this issue, uh, that your firm is willing to take an investment where you're a first lien and, and press the issue to a private equity firm or in the marketplace that if you don't want to pay me, just hand me the keys then. Right. And many firms uh, were quite surprised. One of the reasons Donald Trump remained solvent <laughs> is because the banks had loaned him money for his casinos. They said, we want our money. He said, I'm not going to give you the money, but you can have the keys. And they were so terrified to take the keys that they said, no, no, it's okay. You can keep running. <laughs> And that's so, a true story. So capital structure, Howard, you know, I think both you and I feel it's very important. In yeah. the 1970s, this <laughs> enormous volatility, half the value a company could have was when you financed how you financed. Right. And so we've come through a period of here of no covenants, extremely low rates. And so if you have no covenants, it's hard to default unless you're, you get at maturity from that standpoint. Talk to us about how you see capital structure and risk. Well, I think that as Mike says, it's a much, it, it was for a long time much ignored that for, for, for a given company, there can be a good company, a, a capital structure or a bad capital structure. If, if, you, if you want to start a company and you need $100 million and you put in $100 million, um, that's viable, but it may be less than optimal because you could have maybe borrowed some of that money at 3%, which would amp up the return on the other money, on the, uh, on the equity. On the other hand, if you say, uh, I want to start a company, I need $100 million, you go to the bank and they give you 99, if the value of the company declines by a few percent, you're, you're insolvent. You've lost all your equity. In that case, the capital structure was wrong because the, the business was too volatile to have a highly levered capital structure. So, of course, one of the things that emerged in the 70s and people have made a science of ever since is getting the optimal capital structure for a company. The higher the leverage, the higher the return on equity when things go well, the lower the leverage, the higher the likely, it, the more likely you are to get through tough times. So you have to optimize on that, and it's it's a serious pursuit. Now the the, the PhDs will tell you that they can compute the optimal capital structure uh, using an algorithm. I think it's best uh, a matter of judgment, because among other things, given the fact that the equity is what gets you through the tough times, somebody has to make a judgment, in my opinion. How tough is tough? How bad an environment do we have to prepare for? What is the right capital structure for that? So for myself, I did my credit work at Berkeley, and then I focused my master's work on capital structure in the latter part of the 60s. And I think we will look back <clears throat> at the current period <clears throat> and ask yourself if you're borrowing money at four and three quarters with no covenants for seven years. Is that an asset or is that a liability? To the lender. Right. Yes. Did you read the latest memo? Yes, I did. So I, I put out a memo two weeks ago uh, <clears throat> titled The Seven Worst Words in the World. Now, remember, the four worst words in the world were, it's, it's different this time, the seven worst words in the world are too much money chasing too few deals. And I believe that that's been descriptive of our environment in the last few years. <clears throat> and when there's too much money in the hands of providers of finance, and they are too eager to put that money to work, bad things happen. And interest rates get bid down, and risk <coughs> is bid up. Because the, uh, uh, if you have no covenants, then you have a, a, a defective instrument. 
and, and a, a higher probability of losing money as a lender. And I think that's what's happened. And, and, uh, uh, but this is one of the many things in the world which is cyclical. And uh, uh, I think we'll see a cycle in this too. Should we take some questions? Uh, we're going to take some, but I just want to come. And if you want to look at 77 to 79 pages in the book, you'll see Howard's comments on capital structure. Why don't we take a couple questions? Anyone want to ask a question this morning of Howard? Uh, could you comment on covenants? <laughs> Are covenants cyclical? Some have argued that covenants aren't required for high quality credits. Your thoughts on covenants? So Jim Williams, uh, Chief Investment Officer of the Getty, has asked us uh, a question on covenants. Are, are covenants cyclical? The demand for covenants is cyclical, mm -hmm. and, that, and, and, of course, and that, of course, makes companies cyclical. Mm -hmm. And why is the demand for companies cyclical? Because, number one, the, the, the more money that is in the hands of lenders and the more eager they are to put it out, the less they have the ability to demand covenants because of the competition to lend. And the other thing is that, that the, there's a chapter in the book which talks about the cycle in attitudes towards risk. And attitudes towards risk change volatilely and, and with great influence. And when things are going well, what do people say? Risk is my friend. The more risk I take, the more money I make, and I'm out to optimize, maximize risk, and by the way, I don't <coughs> see anything to worry about. So when people feel that way, clearly, they feel, well, I can dispense with covenants because I don't see anything to worry about. And then, when things go bad for a while, what do they say? I hate risk. <laughs> Bearing risk is just another way to lose money. I don't care if I ever make any money in the market again. I just don't want to lose any more. Get me out at any price. And when people are in this terrified mode and risk <laughs> aversion soars, then they demand risk premiums. And they can get them because there aren't a lot of people competing to put money out. The few people who will put money out uh, can be demanding and get what they want in terms of covenants. So I think it is very cyclical, um, mostly stemming from the demand side. I think this is a really important point that Howard has made. <clears throat> uh, the value of a security might be more dependent on the covenants <clears throat> than the interest rate. Yeah. And understanding that issue then in some cases, it is the covenants that give you full recovery. By the way, Mike, I think we, for, the, for the people who, here who aren't credit pros, I think we should say one word about what covenants are. <clears throat> covenants <clears throat> are protective verbiage in a bond indenture, a debt contract, which requires certain standards be met by the borrower. So, and there are two kinds. There's incurrence and maintenance. Incurrence means you had to f satisfy certain standards on the day the debt is incurred. And maintenance means you have to satisfy certain standards throughout the outstanding period of the loan. And clearly, the, these, you know, the covenants don't protect the company from falling on bad times. But if it falls on bad times and it violates a covenant, a maintenance covenant, then the creditors have the opportunity to become active and to make certain demands and to gain influence and, and, and so forth. And so the presence of maintenance covenants limit the deterioration of a credit. And in, in profligate times, people stop demanding maintenance covenants. We get what's called covenant cov light, as we are now. And that means that, th that the, the, the operations of the company can deteriorate through the outstanding period of the debt. And as long as they continue to pay the interest, then the creditors have no influence. And, and uh, what that means is that if there eventually is a bankruptcy, there will be much less there to recover from. And I would say today, in uh, late 2018, that one of the riskiest areas does lie in triple B, the lowest level of investment grade, mm -hmm. where there are no covenants. And we've all seen through history, <clears throat> with many private equity people in the room, uh, that you can use that debt without any covenants 
to become at the bottom of the pile and a redoing of the capital structure. By the way, I want to tell you a story <coughs> that, that I don't think I've told you, but I was once speaking to a University of Chicago, uh, uh, no, a Wharton credit conference, and somebody asked the question, what is the role of the <coughs> rating agencies? And I said, the role of the rating agencies is to be wrong. <laughs> because when they put out a rating which is either too high or too low, it gives us something to shoot against, right? I think today for the audience, thinking about the ratings and credit and capital structure. So Uber is selling debt, its first real public type debt. It has valuations, 50, 60 billion dollars and little to no debt. The debt is rated triple C, about the lowest you can possibly be rated while you're not in bankruptcy. So the perception of equity markets of enormous growth. Tesla, a company also worth 40, 50, 60 billion dollars, has debt that trades at triple C. WeWork, a company we read about today and October 18 that someone wants to buy the whole company for $20 billion has one issue of debt outstanding, rated triple C. So what is this dichotomy between companies worth 20, 40, 60 billion dollars with little to no debt? And I think if we go back and listen and read this book of Market Sile, you'll see that many industries have so much risk that even though you think they're valuable, they might not be able to take on any debt from that standpoint. Let's take one or two more questions. Yes, sir. Um, so on the back of the financial crisis, we have undergone what I think is the biggest monetary experiment in the history with the global coordinated uh, central bank actions. That is kind of a two-part question. One, do, we, do you feel like we are out of the clear from, I mean, we have some, still have some Well, um, I think the response to the financial crisis was terrific. I think the financial crisis had the potential to really produce a depression. And if you read Hank Paulson's book, you know, you'll see he was terrified. And what I was telling people back in <coughs> 08, uh, you know, there was, was a newscaster, I may have been, may have been Walter Cronkite, who once said, if you're not confused, you don't understand what's going on. And I told people in 08, if you're not afraid, you don't understand what's going on. I mean, we were highly levered. The banks were in free fall. And, and it looked like there was a vicious circle going on. Uh, and I think that Paulson, Bernanke, and Geithner did great things aggressively, and they worked. So I, don't, I, I would, there's anybody who would second guess anything they did is an idiot. Uh, and, and we are in the clear vis-a-vis -vis the global financial crisis. And clearly, especially in this country, you know, the other countries did not take the actions that those, that trio took at, or to, as early or as uh, aggressively. And the, the other countries are not doing as well as we are and have not recovered to the same extent. So the, the, the direct effects of the global financial crisis are over, and we're doing quite well. We are, we are in the 10th year of an economic recovery, the 10th year of a bull market, et cetera. However, the actions that we took to get out of the finan global financial crisis were extreme, and the, like, like all those medicines they advertise on TV, they have side effects. And we're not, now we have to go off the medicine. And you, you described it, I think you described it as an experiment. And if you conduct an experiment for the first time, it's folly to say that you know how it's going to go. There, there, there was never a stimulative exercise to the extent of the QE uh, and the rate cuts. It never had rates at zero before. And 
so now that we're trying to reverse the influences and, and sell the bonds, the securities that were bought through the quantitative easing, and bring the interest rates back up in the direction of normal, <clears throat> you can't say how it's going to go. The world central banks you know, have $22 trillion on their balance sheet now, almost probably quadruple what they had in normal time. And they have to end that. How's it going to go? What's going to be the effect? Can't tell you. So, and, and most people, you know, over the last year or two, uh, there, uh, I get a lot of questions. And you, usually you can tell what's going on in the world from the questions, because usually at a point in time, a lot of people ask the same question. And one of the questions I've been getting for the last uh, couple of years is, what could go wrong? You know, everything's going swimmingly, but we know it's not going to go well forever. What could bring it to a close? And clearly, an unspecified miscalculation by the Fed is one of those things. We don't know enough to know what the error would be, but we know that when you're doing something unprecedented, there can be error. I'd say you're allowed to do research. So what is the research? Let's look at liquidity in the world. <clears throat> so Howard said there is $22 trillion held by Federal Reserve Banks in the world. Well, there's 26 trillion in deposits by Chinese nationals. There's 17 trillion yielding zero deposits by uh, Japanese individuals. Japanese financial institutions today have changed dramatically, but so have the corporations. And corporations in Japan are holding 6 trillion US in cash, 120% of the GDP of the country. Individuals in America, percentage of their assets in cash is double what it was in 07, 08. And so one of the challenges in the world is this enormous liquidity that Howard has spoken about today that's driven up asset values, but we still have trillions of dollars invested at negative rates adjusted for inflation. So we are not where we were in 07, 08. And lastly, I asked each of you, uh, where would you hold your assets today? And if you're a citizen of, Ch of China, for example, what percent of your assets do you want in a different currency, in a different country? Do you want 20%? Would you be willing to transfer $5 trillion in assets to US dollars? today, and so when you've seen the volatility of currencies, one of the things that you, as you reflect on U.S. financial markets is, who wants to get their money into the U.S. dollar? So I can get it in a couple ways. I can just hold cash in the bank, or I can buy a U.S. government security that pays me more than zero. And so we've heard today from Howard about liquidity in the world that has driven up asset prices. But this liquidity exceeds the amount that central governments are holding in assets today. And so that is one of the challenges. Uh, let's take another question. Yes, sir. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, opportunity zones and is uh, Oak Tree gearing up towards uh, I haven't really spent much time on that. I don't have a good answer. Maybe Mike does. The Institute has a major effort on that area. Uh, our Center for Financial Markets is been one of the leaders in creating those opportunity zones. And if you're interested, I'm sure you could go to the website and take a look at this. This is really more related to rebuilding areas of the country and incentivizing you on know, a tax plan. One more question. You showed a chart earlier that showed the rise of passive investing and what's come with that has been a rise of algorithmic and high frequency trading. <clears throat> Do you think that fundamentally changes the volatility of the market more than the behavior of the market? Um, you know, I, I get that question a lot, and, and, and in particular, have these uh, tactics uh, artificially ra raised the level of the market? I don't think so. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, but, you know, you look at algorithmic, for example. These guys buy and sell massive amounts within a fraction. So I don't see how constantly buying, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell could bias the market 
in, in either direction. Uh, I just don't see it. Now, the passive in our, and, and uh, index investing, um, the, the key, I also think that that does not in itself raise the level of the market. But what it does is it, it, it knights certain stocks as popular and certain stocks as unpopular. Let's take the extreme example. All the money that's going to flow into the stock market in the next 10 years is going to flow into S&P index funds. What that means is there would be enormous demand for the S&P stocks. They would go to prices which are exaggeratedly high. There'd be no demand for any other stocks. They would fall to prices which are too low. So clearly the effect is that when it's, see, th when there's passive and, and index investing, the key is that nobody ever says, should the money go into that stock and is today's price fair? If it's in the index or in the passive recipe, it goes in regardless of the merits of the company or the fairness of the price. So clearly, passive and index investing has the, has the potential and probably has bi biased the market in, in terms of made some stocks higher than they should be and some stocks lower. And uh, you know, if, if uh, Amazon, for example, is held today by value um, ETFs and growth ETFs and high quality ETFs and you know and large company ETFs as it is as a way to attract money. <coughs> when people change their mind and want to get out, who's going to buy those stocks? Uh, if 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 the buying was on autopilot, elevating their prices, who, what buying is going to counter that? So I want to separate your question into two parts just for the audience today. One, passive investment that Howard's really dwelled on here uh, is not making any value decisions. <clears throat> but algorithm, or let's call it um, AI investing, is quite different. You have people all over the world writing algorithms to try to predict what occurred. <clears throat> In closing, I, I want to discuss one area that I want to stress to each of you. If you read this book, you will learn about many market cycles. Uh, Howard goes into detail of what occurred in these cycles, and particularly focused on this 08 cycle to today, but looking back at other cycles. When we talk about risk, and trying to minimize risk. You know, there's many types of risk. Walking out your front door is a risk. The probability of driving in a car is a risk. Flying in an airplane is a risk. That everyone is making a decision every day. What is the risk? And so one of the things I want to come back to is where Howard started and where this book is so important. And that is understanding psychology. You have psychologists, Danny from Chicago, who won a Nobel Prize in economics from trying to understand psychology. And when you think about it, we had a period of time, and one of the other risks is regulation and understanding regulation. Because you can put regulation in place that puts any company out of business any industry out of business by changing the rules. If you go back into another point in history when the nobility in England could no longer compete with the mercantile class, what did the nobility do? They went to the king and said, we need new rules, that we're allowed to compete and you're not allowed to compete. And Howard and I lived through a period in the latter part, started in the mid-1980s, which I call neutron legislation. It's okay to loan money against a building, but you can't loan any money to a person that would occupy the building. And remember, there's only four or 500 investment grade companies in America out of millions. And so legislation was introduced and Howard and I had an opportunity in Washington in 85, I think it was, or yeah. six, to visit to ban the ability to invest in non-investment grade debt by pension funds, 
by mutual funds, by insurance companies, et cetera, and introduced banning the deductibility of interest. So if you were non-investment grade, you could not deduct interest. If you were investment grade, you could. And it was basically put forth. And these memories are indelibly imprinted in my mind, and I think yourself, Howard. What shocked you? And this is why I want to stress how, what importance Howard plays in taking complicated things and making them sound that you can understand them. Because if we don't have the citizens of the United States understand the financial system and what it's created for us, then you can rest assured in a democracy they will vote for another form of system as to what occurred in Venezuela a number of years ago. And so Howard and I spent a year or so or two trying to educate people that uh, most of the jobs in the country were created by non-investment grade and why do we want to ban access to capital to companies that are growing? In today's world, you would be saying you can't buy any Uber debt, you can't uh, buy any Tesla debt, you can't buy WeWorks debt, and so on. We're talking about Many most of your tech companies are not investment grade, no matter what their market cap today. Howard, what, what were your memories you've taken today, where, you know, 35 years later almost, from that period of time? And how did this have a factor in your desire to write to try to explain these things? Well, I, I, look, I, I'd like to, like you, <clears throat> I think that since we are a democracy, we better have educated voters. Uh, you know, uh, right now and among the millennials, there's a, most people think that uh, socialism might be a great idea. Uh, you know, and it's easy, it's easy to stand up and say, oh, you know, we should have universal health care, we should have a free education in college. Um, uh, you know, my, my uh, late uh, stepmother used to think that everybody should get a vacation and a color TV. Uh, and all these things gr sound great and would get a lot of voters, uh, but you have to understand the consequences. Yeah, things have costs. Uh, you know, uh, economics is really the, the study of choices, and you have to make choices. Do you, spend, do you, you, you can't do everything. Do you want to spend your money here, here, or here? And if you want to spend money, where are you going to get it from? These are, these, are the, these are all the topics that people have to be educated on. If you put it in a question mark, do you think that, that, uh, that uh, college should be free or not? Most people would have no incentive to say no, but at what cost, with what consequences, um, and um, and uh, so I, I'm I'm with you in terms of wanting an educated populace. So yeah. in closing today, um, I just want to show you a chart from this cycle, Larry. If you have that chart showing high yield performance, late '80s to early '90s, I'd like you to pull it up for a moment and. Here is a cycle <clears throat> where this legislative uh, caused a dramatic change in the marketplace. And once the country realized you were eliminating 100% of all job creation, it reversed in the next year. Let's lay 91 in here. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So you made 40% in one year on your money. This was not induced by a market cycle that Howard talks about, but by a legislative cycle. And, and I stress this, that it's important in understanding that good government's important, good management's important. So in closing, Howard, we had a number of people come here today, and one of the reasons they came here today was to get your signature uh, on their books. So... At what price? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if everybody lines up, I'd be glad to do so. Okay, great. And thank I you. think we thank you, and uh, I don't think you fully realize the importance of your writing and trying to make complicated things in finance understandable to the general public. So thank you. Howard. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Thank you.